Now, to uh, give the Charles Best oration, uh, we have none other than Dr. Professor uh, Dr. Brian Kelly, uh, who is a PhD and he's the head of uh, school and dean of medicine and School of Medicine and Public Health, University of Newcastle and University of New England, Australia. Uh, he is the conjoint administration assistant, School of Medicine and Public Health, Faculty of Health and Medicine, University of Newcastle, Australia. He's also the adjunct professor, School of Rural Medicine, University of New England, Australia, and also adjunct professor, Cummings School of Medicine, University of Calgary. He has been awarded several awards, including two, uh, the 200, uh, 2009 Annual National Drug and Alcohol Awards winner excellence in research, 213 uh, research achievement award for suicide prevention in Australia, 2014 award for research excellence, Hunter Medical Research Institute, and 2015 outstanding skilling initiative resource industry skill association for working well program. And finally, in 2018, he was awarded the Bernard Fox Award for the International Psycho-Oncology, from the International Psycho-Oncology Society. So over to Professor Brian Kelly, and he would be talking on uh, endocrinology and psychiatric crosstalk, something which we face quite commonly in our day-to-day -day practice. Over to you, Brian. Thank you so much, Demolia. And uh, can I just check that you can hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Thanks for that very warm welcome, and it's a great, uh, delight to be joining you all again, although virtually, to uh, uh, talk and and, and uh, meet and discuss these important issues. And I'm very sorry not to be over there uh, with you all at the moment, but of course, we face this global challenge of COVID. And in many ways, the 100 year anniversary of the discovery of insulin is a testament to uh, just how important medical discoveries are. And we've witnessed this over the last 12 months with the rapid development of vaccine and vaccines just showing us what um, medical research can achieve. Uh, it's a, a real privilege to be part of this Charles Best uh, anniversary symposium and presenting this lecture today. And thanks also to all of my colleagues there at the uh, KPC Medical College in Calcutta for your generous welcome and, and the opportunity to work with you over the last uh, few years in this uh, really exciting work that we're doing together. Um, I'm going, I'm, in addition to the, the, the roles that Ted Malley was describing, my specialist background is as a psychiatrist and my area in psychiatry is working with people with physical illness. So I work in a general hospital alongside my colleague, uh, Dr. Shana Charia, and uh, you'll see patients who uh, are in the hospital with a range of uh, physical health problems and uh, and provide psychiatric consultation and support to those patients. So I'm going to be talking with you briefly today about the relationship between psychiatry and endocrine disorders, but with a particular focus on uh, diabetes mellitus. So I'll talk about the psychiatric aspects of diabetes, which are, as you'd expect and understand, I'm sure from your own practice, many and varied, but also touch upon other endocrine condi conditions and their relationship uh, with psychiatry. Uh, and a particular, particularly important area of the glucocorticoids and psychiatric disorders, something that's seen Brand, very, very Brand, commonly. Yes. Brian, your, your screen is white. Uh, I think there is some uh, problem. There is the an screen. option uh, which will allow you to choose the PPT. I think somehow the white screen option has been chosen. Right. Okay. Shall I try to share again and see what happens? You, I think you should uh, uh, stop share and then uh, go for resharing this slide. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you see it now? No. Not really, no, no, no. no. Uh, I think if you stop sh share and then you reshare your slides. I stop share. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can yeah. see me now. Yeah, uh, it is okay. Now you uh, share share slide. You will have options of white screen PPT, etc., etc. You just have to choose the PPT. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. 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 My apologies. No, oh, um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this whole new world of Zoom challenges us all. Um, uh, we learn every day, but <laughs> we learn every day, don't we? Uh, my apologies. And so, one of the things I think sits as an important context this discussion is what we understand about the relationship between endocrine function and brain brain uh, function and brain disorders. We know that endocrine function has an important influence on brain development, on the uh, effective cognitive function within the brain, and has significant impacts on mood and behaviour. And some of the conditions that I'll be describing illustrate that uh, very well. We also know that our psychological state and psychiatric factors can influence endocrine functioning. The stress response is perhaps the classic example when we look at what happens to our hypothalamic and pituitary and adrenal axis in states of normal and abnormal stress and the impact that that can have over time. And there's been a lot of interest in this particular phenomenon in the impact of, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder and, its, and uh, its consequences, but also in conditions like very severe forms of depression, where we know that HPA access during that depressed period is uh, greatly disturbed. And we know that there are uh, uh, significant psychiatric complications of many endocrine conditions, reflecting that the brain is greatly influenced by the endocrine environment throughout the body. So let's talk firstly about diabetes mellitus. Um, I want to focus on depression because it's one of the most common complications that occurs in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. It has around about a 15% prevalence among people with diabetes, both types, perhaps a little higher in people with type 1 diabetes for reasons that will become clearer as we talk through this presentation. The presence of, di of depression in people with diabetes, as with other uh, depression occurring with other physical illness, is the impact it has on their quality of life their suffering and distress and their functioning overall. And particularly relevant in diabetes is the capacity to adhere to what can be a demanding treatment regimen and, and subsequent risk of uh, diabetes complications. We also know as an important sort of psychosocial context of diabetes care is that the quality of communication between the patient and their clinician and their relationship, their treatment relationship is critical to the patient's outcomes. This is not unique to diabetes, it happens in many conditions, but it's particularly important in diabetes because it's a condition that requires the patient to have an ongoing, close and trusting relationship with their doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers. And the more we can foster that, the better the patient's outcomes will be. Let me talk a bit more about depression. People who are depressed are at higher risk of diabetes, particularly type two diabetes. Having depression and diabetes is associated with greater risk of adverse diabetes outcomes. For those who are depressed, having diabetes can complicate their depression, so working the other way around, so it can make their depression harder to treat and harder for them to recover. They often experience, when the, both conditions exist together, a higher symptom burden, greater functional impairment. Their the problems with their um, uh, treatment and adherence is illustrated in higher HbA1c levels among people who are depressed who have diabetes and problems adhering to diet, exercise and medication, not because people don't want to, but because we know that depression is a condition that robs a person of their motivation, their self-esteem, their self-confidence, all of which are necessary to adhere to what can be a demanding daily treatment regimen. And, uh, and I've mentioned already that the problem of diabetes complications among people with depression and diabetes. This particular slide is from a study of a large number of patients with uh, a range of medical conditions and looking at this issue of multimorbidity. This is a phrase that you'll hear increasingly as we acknowledge the uh, com complexity of chronic disease globally amongst uh, populations um, uh, worldwide. And what I've circled here is some data that shows you the relationship between diabetes and other health conditions. And I particularly want to focus on diabetes and depression here. What this shows you is that the rates of uh, depression among people with diabetes, as I've said, um, can vary up to around uh, 10 to 15%. In this study, they found that 21%, the highest rate was 21%. And that was 
particularly those who are in the most socioeconomically deprived circumstances. So it shows you that the circumstances of a person's life in general can increase the likelihood of having a problem such as depression and that almost double the rates of depression. The consequences of depression and diabetes are is illustrated here with some data from the World Health Surveys that shows you that the, uh, on the uh, axis here, the mental health, sorry, the mean health score, which is a sort of indication of overall health functioning from zero to 100, and a range of chronic conditions with and without depression as a coexisting condition. My apologies, it keeps jumping around. The, um, and what this slide illustrates is that your level of functioning is significantly worse if you have for people uh, with diabetes and depression compared with those with diabetes alone. So as clinicians, it's very, very important to be alert to depression in your patients, treat that depression, and you'll find substantial improvements in the patient's overall functioning and outcomes by doing so. And you can see the functioning across all these conditions tends to be worse when people have a chronic medical condition plus depression in those last those uh, bottom two categories. There are other psychiatric disorders associated with diabetes though. Delirium is a, a common one, usually associated with acute complications of diabetes. By delirium, I mean the organic acute confusional states that you'll see in people who may be experiencing severe hyperglycemia, diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis or um, uh, infection. Anxiety uh, can be prominent in that. For people with diabetes can be specifically focused on diabetes related fears or for those with type one diabetes, perhaps fears and concerns about the demands of uh, insulin injection and adjusting to, the demand, to that treatment. Substance use disorders are of higher prevalence among people with diabetes. And for us in our community here in Australia, that's chiefly alcohol related uh, conditions. And um, from what I understand in India, that those sorts of patterns are changing over time as well. And eating disorders. The management of diabetes is a, um, involves close monitoring, obviously of food intake and, and being uh, careful to adhere to dietary requirements. Interestingly enough, particularly in uh, younger people and young women, eating disorders and binge eating disorders uh, are of higher prevalence. And perhaps as a result of some of the anxiety and focus that occurs around eating, that this becomes a, a way in which some patients experience their worries about diabetes is through um, abnormal patterns of eating. We can come back and talk about that, um, but it can be quite challenging uh, clinically to be treating a patient, for example, with an eating disorder who's insulin, requiring insulin, and maybe has, um, uh, is binge eating or, or anorexic. Coping with diabetes is an important theme. Um, this is an interesting diagram that uh, came from the Indian Journal of uh, Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2018. So it refers to the, um, the factors that influence emotional distress in people coping with diabetes. The initial crisis in response to a diagnosis, given that this can be uh, a condition that is lifelong for many people. Diabetes related distress through the management of diabetes, being overwhelmed by those demands, frustrated, um, uh, the different role that the person might end up having within their family around uh, food and eating requirements and uh, the demands of treatment. As listed there, phobic reactions around needles, injections, becoming preoccupied with fears about hypoglycemia or the development of complications. And some people can become almost obsessively preoccupied with those concerns. And of course, the more formal psychiatric disorders that I've referred to. All of these factors together can influence behaviour that then impacts on glycemic control and quality of life. So the key themes in coping with chronic illness that relate to diabetes specifically include, and this is one that I think is very important to think about and perhaps talk over with your patients of loss. What functions do they, do they have they lost as a result of, uh, of the condition or that they fear losing in the future? How does it change their role their fam in, within their family, within their work and socially? And often, of course, it threatens their independence and autonomy. And sometimes in families, this is a, a big factor where the person 
feels as if they're reliant on others, sometimes reliant on healthcare providers and health systems in a way that they've not been in the past and they can really struggle with that. Um, adapting to their healthcare needs over time, over a long period of time, and sometimes periods of what we call non-adherence or non-compliance can be normal, although frustrating and difficult, um, can be, uh, um, for some people, a protest against their disease, for some, a period of loss of motivation that their clinicians need to help them with. The impact on family and family function perhaps is most clearly demonstrated in young people who have uh, diabetes, but can also be in adults in their family relationships, their relationships with their adult children and, and uh, partners uh, because of the demands it might place on the whole family system. Social impacts can be demonstrated through stigma and the way in which diabetes and diabetes treatments can be highly stigmatised. Um, and for that reason, some people may avoid treatment or disguise their treatment for fear of the reac reactions of others being adversely treated by others because they're seen as having an unacceptable condition. And of course, specific functions and abilities can be of great concern. Uh, loss of sexual function, for example, can be an important um, uh, consequence and fear among patients um, uh, as a result of their condition. There is, in terms of capturing this, there is a, a useful tool that uh, people can use in their practice, which is called the Diabetes Distress Scale. If, if you don't use the scale, instruments like this can give you some really useful questions to include in your regular checkups with patients. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the sorts of things that give you an idea of what do people worry about most? And this sort of scale is built on that, of understanding the common worries. For example, a feeling that I'm often failing in my uh, regimen, feeling that it controls my life, feeling that my, sometimes my doctors or others don't take my concerns seriously. I don't feel confident in managing it. I feel scared or depressed when I think about living with diabetes into my future. I, sometimes these can be very useful questions just to include in your uh, discussions with your patients, even if you don't use those scales. The other area that is of great interest in the psychiatry field, and you'll see patients in this situation in your, in your uh, practice around diabetes, are people with severe mental illness. And by severe mental illness, I mean conditions such as schizophrenia, severe bipolar disorder, or people with severe recurrent major depressive disorders. Uh, in those, that population, particularly people with schizophrenia, we know that diabetes can affect up to 12% of those patients, the majority having type two diabetes. In people with severe mental illness, the di diabetes is associated with greater rates of complications, the microvascular and mac macrovascular complications, acute metabolic disorders, and greater rates of death related to diabetes. We know that people with severe mental illness have higher mortality from physical illness in general, and diabetes is one of those conditions that contributes to that. The, the, why is, does this association exist? Well, there are multiple reasons for that. Some of them are to do with environmental factors as well as uh, the effects of the illness on uh, the patient and their diabetes treatment. Here's an attempt to summarise those various factors uh, from a Nature Review publication. What I'd emphasise here is that, that we know people with severe mental illness often have difficulties maintaining an adequate diet, they're often living in the most economically difficult circumstances and so don't have the resources sometimes to uh, manage the type of uh, diet that's required. Uh, they often suffer with obesity, sometimes due to their physical activity, but often as a result of the antipsychotic drugs that they take, which we know can contribute to a metabolic syndrome and obesity. And they also have higher rates of smoking. Um, all those factors can increase their health risks and the uh, propensity for type two diabetes. We know that their medications can play a role. And this uh, slide from a paper in Lancet Psychiatry gives you an idea of the relationship between the various types of antipsychotic drugs and propensity for uh, diabetes. And the highest risk is associated with the drugs clozapine and olanzapine. And certainly here in Australia, olanzapine is very commonly used. Uh, for the treatment of psychotic disorders. And this is a, a real concern in our patient population to manage this metabolic risk. There are a set of guidelines for monitoring metabolic risk in people who are uh, suffering a disease like schizophrenia and re receiving these, what we call second generation antipsychotics, 
and that's listed in this paper. I won't go through all of this because you'll have a, a chance to have a look at these slides and I'd recommend that paper to you, which looks at um, how to manage this risk in these patients. But regular monitoring of their uh, HbA1c's fasting glucose, obviously blood pressure and fasting lipids and weight can be very important. So the summary of all of this is that screening for diabetes mellitus in individuals with severe mental illness is important and uh, uh, will identify those with a high rate of people who have undiagnosed diabetes in that population. Let's talk now, moving on to psychiatric aspects of other endocrine conditions. Thyroid disease is probably one of the classic um, psychiatry endocrine hormonal uh, connections and relationships. The psychiatric symptoms are very common and may be the presenting complaint for someone suffering from a thyroid dis disorder. Thyrotoxicosis particularly can be associated up to 80% of those patients will experience psychiatric symptoms. We're all familiar with that kind of accelerated, anxious, irritable, emotional ability that can occur in thyrotoxicosis and sometimes to a level of experiencing panic. Interestingly though, in older patients, you can get what we call a sort of hypoactive or withdrawn thyrotoxic state where they appear more depressed or even more like what you would expect to find in a hypothyroid state. So be alert to that, that sometimes depression in the elderly can be related to thyrotoxicosis, quite, quite different to what you might see in younger people. And of course, um, it can be misdiagnosed as an anxiety disorder. And hence in psychiatry, we often request thyroid function tests in someone presenting for the first time with severe anxiety related symptoms. Hypothyroidism is another classic example of this relationship. And historically, you'll be familiar with the term, I'm sure, of myxedema madness, which was uh, used to describe in the early part of last century, the observation of psychotic symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, marked disorganization of thinking in people suffering hypothyroidism, also known as myxedema, of course. The cognitive impairment can be marked, and this is particularly in the elderly, with slowing of cognition or slowing of thinking and memory impairment. And hence, hypothyroidism is an important differential diagnosis in someone presenting with what looks like a dementia syndrome in later life. Be alert to this as a potentially reversible cause of something like a dementia. And so that slowing and memory impairment can sometimes even look like a depression with low mood and slowing of behaviour. So be alert to that also. There's also, of course, a specific consideration for us in psychiatric treatments around uh, the use of lithium, which can inhibit thyroid hormone synthesis and can cause clinically significant hypothyroidism. Hence, the monitoring of lithium treatment includes monitoring thyroid function. Cushing syndrome is uh, another important uh, condition to consider in its psychiatric re relationships and, and complications. Um, it's it's uh, classically associated with depression, with up to 80% of patients with Cushing's reporting significant depressive symptoms. A smaller percentage can be experienced, can experience quite extreme psychiatric symptoms in the form of psychosis. There could be rapid mood fl fluctuations and again, um, reversible cognitive impairment. Again, illustrating through Cushing syndrome the, the important role that glucocorticoids have on brain function. Similarly, with adrenal insufficiency, psychiatric symptoms are, similar, are also common, um, more in the form of apathy, withdrawal, and extreme fatigue. Um, depression in about 50%, again, cognitive impairment. And the slow onset of adrenal insufficiency can sometimes lead to a misdiagnosis of initially of a psychiatric condition when the adrenal insufficiency is the underlying cause. And of course, in an Addisonian crisis, uh, delirium and psychotic symptoms associated with delirium can occur. I'll move on now to talk about um, exogenous corticosteroids, usually prescribed corticosteroids. You'll see this a lot in clinical practice because these drugs are very obviously very commonly used, but there are, is a very important and clinical, clinically significant range of neuropsychiatric side effects. Important message here is it's usually dose dependent. It's reversible when you reduce the dose but the prevalence can be quite high. And it's estimated that around 18% or more of those patients receiving upwards of 40 milligrams a day of prednisone or equivalent will experience clinically significant 
neuropsychiatric side effects that they'll often quite readily describe to you as you inquire. Sometimes sleep disturbance, agitation, mood change, irritability, uh, and uh, uh, either depression or sometimes even elevation of mood. Again, those are the features, the mood elevation, restlessness, sometimes of acute onset. We see this, for example, clinically with people receiving high dose dexamethasone. One area that I've been doing some work in is in palliative care where we often use high dose dexamethasone and you often see very acute onset of these symptoms. Um, depression can occur uh, with chronic corticosteroid use accumulating over time and sometimes with corticosteroid withdrawal. Um, the, one of the important things is that steroid-induced mood disorder seems to be more likely to be associated with psychotic symptoms than a than non-steroid-related mood disorder. So the steroids seem to be particularly likely to cause psychotic symptoms, for, for example, hallucinations or delusional beliefs associated with the depression. It's important to remember that the timing of the onset can be at any time during treatment. It's not just when a person starts on corticosteroids, um, uh, it can occur at any time. So it's important to be vigilant to this, even in someone who's been taking corticosteroids for quite some time. You might feel that they've adapted well to it, that, that there are no obvious uh, uh, side effects, but then they start to develop these psychiatric symptoms, even though you may not have changed dose at all recently. It still can be related to the corticosteroids. And that's one of the challenging aspects clinically is it's unpredictable when and who will develop these uh, symptoms. Um, one thing that is important to remember is those who've had a previous course of uh, corticosteroids and developed psychiatric symptoms uh, um, have a modest increase in the likelihood of experiencing those symptoms in future uh, um, treatments. It doesn't mean that you don't use corticosteroids, but it might, it, particularly if it's essential to use them, it just means that you would work with that patient to identify what those early signs might be, and maybe institute some, some early uh, preventive treatment. And we can come back and talk about that later. So these are some of the, some of the sort of general indicators. The dose is a, is a, is a factor to consider. Um, uh, as I've said, someone who's had a pre similar disorder during past treatment. Interestingly, men are more likely to develop a manic or, or elevated mood. Women more likely to develop depression with corticosteroids. And in younger people, there's a very concerning association between corticosteroids and suicidal behavior and panic disorder. Um, so twice the elevated risk of suicide, about four to five times the risk of mania, which is a very, very disruptive and serious condition, delirium and, uh, and self-harm, probably self-harm associated with depression. Withdrawal of corticosteroids also has its psychiatric symptom. I've listed those there. It follows prolonged exposure, greater than two weeks. It again can be dose dependent, has a range of symptoms, um, and obviously is important to differentiate from uh, adrenal insufficiency caused by stopping the corticosteroids, um, a specific corticosteroid withdrawal syndrome, and re-emergence of the underlying disease. The re-emergence of the underlying disease is challenging because, of course, that might mean reinstituting corticosteroids, and that might cause further. Uh, complications, but balancing that risk and benefit of the corticosteroids for a patient who's having psychiatric side effects is not an uncommon clinical um, uh, conundrum. And these clinical conundra are described here, the steroid withdrawal or re-emergence of underlying steroid responsive pathology and balancing the risks and benefits. And this is where we often add additional psychiatric treatment to ensure that the patient can remain on their essential steroid therapy. That may be antidepressant medication, it may be antipsychotic medication, so that they can get the benefits of the steroid therapy without the side effects. Anabolic steroids, moving on to a completely different topic now, are of course another important uh, uh, issue in, in uh, this relationship between endocrinology and psychiatry. They have had therapeutic use in the treatment of depression and in the treatment of fatigue, particularly fatigue in situations such as palliative care. But probably most common that uh, most commonly that you'll be familiar with is the non-therapeutic use, or if I could call it the recreational use of anabolic steroids, uh, particularly for bodybuilding and so on. Um, irritability, aggression, manic-like symptoms, and even delirium can occur. 
and 23% of those with medium to high dose uh, use of testosterone use can experience major mood disorder and a very high rate of psychotic symptoms in about 12%. This is usually complicated by other factors associated with uh, the reasons people use antibiotic steroids. So body image disturbance, disturbance in personality functioning and other substance use. Commonly here, we would see people misusing antibiotic steroids alongside other substances. But body image disturbance usually underlies it because they're using the steroids to deal with their body image disturbance. For the sake of completeness, I've also included here some other endocrine conditions just to uh, recognize the psychiatric complications that can occur. Hyperparathyroidism through hypercalcemia causing those uh, conditions, uh, depression, delirium, hypoparathyroidism. Pheochromocytoma is a condition that we often um, consider very carefully in psychiatry, particularly for people who might have paroxysmal sy symptoms that, that mimic panic attacks with palpitations and agitation, anxiety, tremor, sweating. Sometimes we're keen to exclude a pheochromocytoma to explain that, those sorts of par paroxysmal uh, symptoms. And uh, hypogonadism. Um, uh, as, an, as another set of conditions can have uh, wide ranging psychiatric uh, complications and uh, consequences, depending on the age of onset, of course. But uh, uh, they're just listed there, particularly specific issues related to Klinefelter syndrome. Estrogen and progesterone have their own uh, uh, set of psychiatric and psychological issues. We know that postpartum psychiatric disorders are likely to be related to changes in levels of progesterone and estrogen in the postpartum period. And of course, uh, women can experience severe postpartum depression and psychosis. And premenstrual dysphoric disorder is another condition that's important to note. And we're more aware now of the important role of uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors as antidepressants and their benefit for people with premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And of course, the long recognized uh, menopause related psychiatric symptoms um, with elevated risk of depression during that period. And just finally, I wanted to mention the endocrine complications of psychiatric treatments. I referred already to lithium, which uh, uh, can cause hypothyroidism and hyperparathyroidism, antipsychotic agents and the metabolic syndrome, but also their propensity to cause hyper, hyperprolactinemia and uh, galactorrhea for some patients through their impact on dopamine. And uh, uh, inappropriate ADH secretion can be caused by antidepressant agents, particularly the SSRIs and what we call the SNRIs, serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. And of course, hyponatremia can be a very severe and uh, serious condition if uh, a patient's experience what we call a hyponatremic encephalopathy. Uh, but we commonly see patients presented to hospital with hyponatremia, particularly elderly patients, on um, antidepressants and needing to establish whether the antidepressants have contributed to hyponatremia. So in summary, I've attempted to cover very quickly some of the psychiatric aspects of diabetes mellitus specifically, but also the other endocrine conditions that might be encountered. And particularly sometimes the, the uh, uh, what are very prominent psychiatric symptoms that might even be the first presentation of those underlying disorders and the important side effects that are experienced uh, both during the use and withdrawal of glu glucocorticoids. So thank you, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thanks for your attention.